Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Tonight, I'm continuing in the study of the book of John, and I'm going to pick up where I left off last time, beginning with chapter 7, verse 25. Now, if, if you have not seen the previous studies on John, uh, they are uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Uh, I hope you will go back and watch this from the beginning, particularly with this, this book, John, is, I believe, the most important book in the entire Bible. So please go back and watch it. And uh, for now, I'm going to begin chapter 7, verse 25. Uh, I'll look at it first in the KJV, and then uh, if I think it may be helpful, I'll look at it in the Amplified. So it says... Then said some of them of Jerusalem, Is this not he whom they seek to kill? But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? So it seems that uh, the people, you know, he first uh, told his own brothers that he would not go into Jerusalem. They urged him to go in, and he said, no, he wouldn't go in because they're seeking to kill him. Uh, and yet he ends up going in secretly, uh, and now he's making himself known to everybody. They know he's there, and everybody's surprised because it's, it's no secret. These uh, Jewish religious leaders want to kill him. And why? Because of his claims. Uh, that he is the Christ. And so uh, they are saying here, um, do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? In other words, he's here. They said they wanted to kill him, and yet they're not killing him. So maybe now they, maybe they understand, and maybe they believe this is the very Christ. I'm going to read this in the Amplified and see how it states it. Then some of the people of Jerusalem said, is this not the man they want to kill? Look, he's speaking publicly, and they say nothing to him. Is it possible that the rulers really know that this is the very Christ? Uh, now, uh, I'll also go a little further in the Amplified. It says, but we know where this man is from. Whenever the Christ comes, no one will know where he is from. Uh, so there, on one hand... They're talking about, hey, this is, uh, he's he's here in spite of the fact they pro they said that they would kill him. And uh, does the fact that he, they're not killing him right now, is that uh, proof that, that now they're believing in him? Could this really be the Christ? And then they say, well, no, because we know where he's from. We, we're not going to know where the Christ comes from because, you know, he, he grew up, uh, he was born in Bethlehem. He was raised in Nazareth. He's from Galilee. Uh, of course, they're probably not even aware he was born in Bethlehem uh, because uh, later on, uh, the point comes up that uh, nothing good comes out of Nazareth. There's no acknowledgement that he's originally from Bethlehem. Otherwise, they would have been able to um, understand that the scriptures prophecy that the Messiah would come from Bethlehem. Let me continue on in the, in the KJV, and it says, um, ver, verse 27, I'll start there. How be it we know this man whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, Ye both know me, and ye know whence I am. And I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true whom ye know not. Uh, so he, he is saying, yeah, you, uh, you know me, and ye know whence I am. Let me read that in the Amplified, verse 28. It says, then Jesus called out as he taught in the temple, you know me and know where I am from. I, am, I have not come on my own initiative as self-appointed, but he who sent me is true, and him you do not know. Uh, 
so he is saying here, you know where I am from, but that's only in the physical sense. You see, they know he's from uh, uh, Nazareth. They know his, his, uh, about his mother, his brothers, his family. Um, some of the people probably have known him since he was young. Uh, and that's why for many people, including in his own family, his brothers, um, they're skeptical, they're doubters, they're not believers. Of course, I believe his mother is a believer all along because she had to. She, she knows who he is because uh, the angel, uh, Gabriel, explained it to her. So she should not have any doubts. But the brothers are not believers. Um, so they, when it says, you know where I'm from, we know where he's from. And he says, yes, you know where I'm from. It's not talking about his ori origin. His, his origin, he came down from heaven. He says that at a future verse that I, no one's set it up to heaven except he who has come down from heaven. So um, now let me look at it further. In the, in the KJV, it says, um, uh, verse 29, but I know him for I am from him and he hath sent me. This is referencing God. Verse 30, then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come. So here we're left to try to figure this out. On one hand, it says they sought to take him. And then it says they did not lay hands on him. And it says the reason was because his hour uh, was not yet come. Now, I know that there's other, other uh, verses. Maybe we'll find them as we continue along in John, where it talks about they want to take him, and he's just like, he's gone. He's no longer there. He's, just, he's somewhere else. So it's like he uh, just got his bodily, he was transported to be somewhere else. He disappeared. Uh, but in this case, it's, it's not saying that at all. It's just saying they want to lay hands on him, but they don't lay hands on him because his hour was not yet come. So... Um, Apparently, we, we have to just conclude that uh, because it was not his time, there was a, a, an intervention from God. God would not permit it, and they were not able to take him, or maybe they were restrained somehow. But they did want to take him, lay hands on him, and kill him. I'm going to look at that in the Amplified. In the Amplified, it says, uh, verse uh, 29, I know him myself because I am from him. I came from his very presence. It was, and it was he personally who sent me. So they were eager to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his time had not yet come. Now I'll go on back to the KJV verse uh, 30, uh, 31. And many of the people believed on him and said, when Christ cometh, Will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? So the miracles are convincing a lot of people. Um, but of course we know that some people uh, deny his miracles uh, as, as from God. They, they, uh, they will blaspheme the Holy Spirit, as Jesus says, because they are rather than believing that his miracles are done through God, they say they're done through the power of Beelzebub, or the devil. So um, even though he's performing miracles and some people are convinced by the miracles, other people, their reaction to the miracles is different. They, they say these miracles just show that it's the devil in them. Um, we're not at that point yet. That will be coming up, and I think that we'll read that in John. Um, verse 31 in the Amplified says, uh, But many from the crowd believed in him, and they kept saying, When the Christ comes, will he do more signs and exhibit more proofs than this man? So these miracles are called signs and proofs. And uh, they've asked him. The, the Jews demand a sign. And, and already, uh, 
in chapter one, I remember uh, they demanded a sign and his answer was destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And, and he, he you know, goes on to say that, uh, well, they, they, their answer to him was, uh, you know, it took, it took our fathers 40 years to build a temple. How can you raise it up in, in only three days? <clears throat> so again, they, they didn't understand his spiritual language. This is a problem throughout the book of John. People are taking him literally instead of understanding the spiritual meaning behind all of these uh, statements. <clears throat> uh, but it, it says that uh, he was not referring to the temple in Jerusalem. He's referring to the temple of his body, referring to his death, burial, and resurrection as the sign. Uh, and, and later on, they'll ask him for a sign. I think that the, <clears throat> the, this next example I'm going to give you is probably a space of three years between the first chapter of John and the very end when they ask him again for a sign. Now, he's already done a lot of miracles. These are considered signs and proofs, signs and wonders. And they're there to convince the Jews because Jews consider these signs uh, to prove his claims are true, that he's from God. <clears throat> but uh, they end up asking him again and, uh, for a sign, and he says, the only sign I'll give you is the sign of Jonah, just as uh, Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Now, this tells us a lot of things from that statement there. First of all, he is quoting the account that we find about Jonah and the whale. Uh, and uh, that that tells us that that's a true story. Uh, it's not some kind of a parable or a fable or something we're supposed to take allegorically. Jesus is uh, quoting it, citing it as a real event. And so it also tells me that Jonah was not swallowed by the whale living inside the whale for three days, that he was swallowed by the whale and actually was dead inside the whale. Because if if Jonah in the whale for three days and three nights and then coming out alive is compared to Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection, then Jonah must be dead because Jesus was dead in the tomb. He wasn't alive in the tomb. Uh, so these are the signs. The Jews demand signs. Jesus has performed all kinds of miracles. His miracles are not merely just to do good deeds and help people, although I'm sure he loves people and wants to heal them. But uh, really, these are signs uh, to prove uh, his claims, his claim that he is God, that he is the Savior, <clears throat> that he's the source of life. Let me go on. I'm going to look at that in the Amplified now. Uh, let me see. Verse 30. No, I'm going to go on to, in the KJV, verse 32. It says, The Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while am I with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me, and ye shall not find me. Where I am, thither ye cannot come. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> mm. Now, uh, he says, okay, I'll be with you for a short time. Then I'm going to leave, and where I'm going, you can't come. So in verse 37, it says, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Let me look at these previous verses before I continue, though. I'm going to read it in the Amplified, starting with uh, verse 32. It says, um, the Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things under their breath about him, and the chief priests and Pharisees sent guards to arrest him. <clears throat> Therefore, Jesus said, for a little while longer I am still with you, and then I go to him who sent me. You will look for me and will not be able to find me, and where I am you cannot come. 
<coughs> so he's he's talking about going to be with the god the father and then it says then the jews said among themselves where does this man intend to go that we will not find him does he intend to go to the dispersion of the jews scattered and living among the greeks and teach the greeks what does this statement of his mean you will look for me and will not be able to find me and where i am you cannot come <clears throat> hmm. that was interesting the amplified translation amplifies the bible in a way in a way i'm giving you my amplified translation because i am reading the scriptures and and expounding commenting or amplifying on it trying to explain it the best i can <clears throat> and that's what the amplified version does whoever are the um, the scholars and writers they, they, they did the amplified version they're doing nothing differently than i'm doing except they may have better credentials than me but they're amplifying it trying to expound on it and tell us what it, these verses mean Okay, let me continue on here. I'm going to go back to the KJV. And it says, uh, let me read the KJV uh, back to uh, verse 35. It says, then said the Jews among themselves, whither will he go that we shall not find him? Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? What manner of saying is this that he said, ye shall seek me and ye and shall not find me and where I am, thither ye cannot come. So they're confused by his statement. They're thinking maybe he's going off to talk to the Jews who are living among the Gentiles, the, um, the, the dispersed Jews. Um, and now verse 37 in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now, again, every time he says something, like uh, to Nicodemus, a man must be born again to see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus takes him literally, thinking he has to go back into his mother's womb. Uh, at the at the well, the Samaritan woman is told by Jesus that if you drink this, you'll never thirst again. You know, it's living water, and she thinks it takes that statement literally. Each time Jesus says, "You don't understand; uh, these are spiritual things," uh, he said earlier, uh, I think in the last chapter, that he said you must eat my flesh and drink my blood uh, and, and uh, they took him literally and thinking that he was telling them to be cannibals and he said they, you don't understand this is spiritual language i'm using and then here again uh, he's talking now about living water he says out of out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water verse 39 says but this spake he of the spirit, which that they that believe on him should receive for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. <clears throat> um, many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said of a truth, this is the prophet. So he's, he's built up many followers. And then when he said, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood he lost most of his followers and now he's building up more followers it's talking about many people are believing in him now but at one point his apostles asked him why he talks in like a riddles or parables and nobody's people are getting confused and they don't understand maybe you've wondered that yourself and he said the reason he does that is so that people can only understand him if they have the right attitude uh, if uh, if they're uh, um, if they don't have humility and and uh, 
understanding that they need they need God. That state of humility that says uh, I'm in a situation where I need to rely on God. If they haven't reached the point of humility, I think that that is the state that he's saying that they'll understand. They want to understand the parables. They want to understand his message. They want to understand his spiritual language, uh, unless they they have this state of humility that uh, allows them to. If they're still thinking that uh, you know they're going to be able to uh, establish their own righteousness and appeal to God, then this is not going to make none of this will make any sense to them. Okay, so continuing on. Uh, verse 40 many of the people therefore when they heard this saying said of a truth this is the prophet others said this is the christ but some said shall christ come out of galilee hath not the scripture said that christ cometh of the seed of david and out of the town of bethlehem where david was so they study the scriptures they know what the scripture says about the christ and but in this case they don't even know he's from bethlehem they think he's from galilee and uh he, but he was born in bethlehem I lived in nazareth in galilee so it says verse 43 so there was a division among the people because of him and some of them would have taken him but no man laid hands on him let me read that in the amplified starting with verse 40 listening to these words some of the people said this is certainly the prophet others said this is the christ the messiah the anointed but others said surely the christ is not going to come out of galilee is he does the scripture not say that the christ comes from the descendants of david and from bethlehem the village where david lived so the crowd was divided because of him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. It doesn't say why no one lays hands on him, except it, it, his time was not yet come. I'm sure that they didn't all say, we want to arrest him, but his time's not yet come, so we can't arrest him yet. They weren't aware of that, but something was preventing them from arresting him at that time. Uh, I believe that God was uh, intervening at this time. You know, God, God is sovereign. God <clears throat> can stick his nose in at any time and interact and control things. But sovereignty of God does not mean that God controls uh, everything that happens. It means that God is able to intervene and take control and make whatever happens whatever he wants to happen. Um, so many people err thinking that God's sovereignty is that he's always controlling everything. In other words, they, these people think that uh, every thought I have, God is putting these thoughts in my head. Every word I speak, God is making them come out of my mouth. Every action I do in my life, God is controlling me like a puppet or a robot. That is uh, Calvinism, and that's a perverted understanding of God's sovereignty. The, uh, God is omnipotent in that he can, he can do whatever he wants, but he's sovereign in that he can, he, he can decide if he wants to exercise that omnipotence or not. And uh, almost all the time, he's not exercising it. He, he lets man have free will, but sometimes a situation like this it says because his time has not yet come and there's no further explanation that there's nothing to telling me why these people are not arresting him. So uh, I have to speculate that uh, somehow God was not allowing it to happen. Maybe he was, uh, I, I, I won't be guessing how he's doing it, but they want to arrest him, but his time has not yet come. Now let's look at... Uh... Go back, continue in the uh, KJV with verse um, uh, 45. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, 
why have ye not brought him? The officers answered, never man spake like this man. Then answered them the Pharisees, are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? But, but this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Nicodemus saith unto them, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? So, these religious rulers, of which Nicodemus is one of them, and uh, they're demanding, well, why isn't he arrested? Why haven't you brought him to us? And the people are so impressed. They say, nobody's ever talked like this. So I think that answers the question. When it, we wonder, uh, they were told to arrest him. They wanted to lay hands on him. They wanted to arrest him, but his time was not yet come. Perhaps it was just the persuasiveness of his words, and they were so impressed, and all, they, were, they were either won over or there's doubts in their mind. Well, if this is the Christ, I better not arrest him. So that was probably what restrained them. And now these religious leaders are, they're upset because he's not arrested. He's not brought to them. And, but Nicodemus, who's one of the leaders, he says, is it, is it legal? He says, doth our law judge any man before it hear him? So he's sticking his nose in there just enough to, to, um, Say, hey, wait, you've got to follow our laws. We can't just be a mob. Let me read all that in the Amplified and see how it phrases it. Um, starting with verse 45, it says, Then the guards went back to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked them, Why did you not bring him here with you? The guards replied, Never at any time has a man talked the way this man talks. Then the Pharisee said to them, have you also been deluded and swept off your feet? Has any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? But this ignorant, contemptible crowd that does not know the law is accursed and doomed. Uh, verse 50, Nicodemus, the one who came to Jesus before he was one of them. Uh, no, the one who came to Jesus before and was one of them. Um, he was one of the Pharisees, asked, does our law convict someone without first giving him a hearing and finding out what he is accused of doing? So then we'll go to finish in the KJV here. And it says in verse 52, they answered and said unto him, art thou also of Galilee? Search and look. For our, out of Galilee arises no prophet. And every man went unto his own house. So they all went home. They're all upset. And they dispersed and go home. But again, they're making the mistake of thinking he's from Galilee. Even though he lived in Galilee. and uh, But he was still born in Bethlehem. They're Apparently, they're just not aware of it. So I don't know if that would have made any difference if... If they were told, hey, he was actually born in Bethlehem, just as the scripture said the Messiah would would be, would it have made any difference? What do you think? Uh, I'm going to end there. That, that concludes chapter 7. Um, all right. Um, and as is my uh, my custom, my policy here, I end every broadcast with a, a few minutes to, uh, to tell you the good news about salvation. Uh, so if, if, if you haven't heard this good news, if you have not received the gift, then uh, pay close attention now. This is the most important information, the most important message you'll ever hear in your life. And I, I pray that you'll believe it and receive it. The question is, do you want to go to heaven? Some people might say, well, that's a stupid question. Doesn't everybody want to go to heaven?
I'll tell you, I've asked that question to thousands of people. And I've actually heard some people say, no, I don't want to go to heaven. If you're someone that says, no, I don't want to go to heaven, that's okay too. But you can keep listening. Maybe someday you'll change your mind and you, you'll say, oh, uh, I do want to go to heaven. Well, do, do, you, do you know what is required of you? Do you know the way to get into heaven? Do you know what you must do so that you can go to heaven? Well, the answers to these questions are in the Bible. You're not going to find the answers to these questions um, on television or on the radio or on all over YouTube or even many of the churches around the country. You're, you're going to find that they're teaching everybody a lie. What I'm going to tell you now is how the Bible answers the question. What do you have to do so you can go to heaven? What's required of you? And in the description box of this video, as in all my videos, uh, I, I list the core doctrines of Christianity and verses that will support you, support the message I'm going to give you now. And that is the message is simply, it's called the gospel because the New Testament was get written in Greek and gospel is a Greek word. It means good news. So I'm going to tell you the good news but it's actually the greatest news ever. And when you hear it, I hope you'll be as happy as, as I was when I heard it. But the question is, what do you have to do to go to heaven? What do you think? Most people think that in order to go to heaven, they've got to live a really good life. And if they're good enough, God, when God judges them and say, well, come on in, you're good enough. Oh, you're not good enough. You go off to hell. You, could, you can come to heaven. Oh, you're not good enough. They think the heaven and hell is determined on a merit system. The, and, and, and if you can strive in your life and put effort in and really work at being good, perhaps you can be good enough to go to heaven. That's a lie from the devil. But all the religions of, of the world, even much of Christendom, they're all teaching that same thing. But what does the Bible say about it? The Bible says that no one is good, not even one person. No one is righteous, not even one. No one is good, only God is good. The Bible says that we're all sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So we're all sinners. None of us are good enough. How good do you have to be? Jesus said, go and be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. The standard is perfection. And, and we all fall short. The Bible says, uh, we all fall short of the glory of God. So let's say that this represents perfection, the glory of God. And this represents mankind's and our attempts to be good. And, and we're all trying to achieve this level of perfection, but we all fall short. No one can do it. And if you decided right now that you're going to try to be perfect for the rest of your life, it's already too late for you because you've already failed. You've already done things that were wrong. And if you can't admit it, that you've, you've done some bad things in your life, you've had some bad thoughts. If you can't admit it, then remember the scripture says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So the first thing you need to understand is that you're not perfect. Admit it. The standard to get to heaven is perfection. So ad, ad, admit defeat and say it's impossible. That's why, why Jesus' apostles asked him, if this is the case, Lord, how is it possible for anyone to be saved? And Jesus said, with man, it is impossible. So this is the first thing I want you to understand is it is impossible to get to heaven by joining religions and uh, becoming a religious person and following set of religious rules and, and striving and hoping your fingers crossed and thinking, oh, I hope I'm, I'm good enough and God accepts me. It's impossible. Now, once you understand that and accept that, then you'll understand your need to be saved because your situation is hopeless. And God understood man's hopeless situation 
And the scripture says, God does not desire that any of us should perish. All right. So what did, does God do about this? The Bible says that God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, so that whoever believes in him, Jesus, will not perish, but will have eternal life. <clears throat> so because God loves us so much, he intervened and said, I'll go down. The Bible says God came down from heaven. God was manifest in the flesh. God became a man named Jesus Christ, the son of God. The Bible says the reason God became a man was so that he could die. You see, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Because of death, is die, we die. The wages of sin, the, pit, the penalty for sin, what you get because of sin is death. So someone has to die. But the Bible says that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation means uh, it's a full payment. It's a satisfactory payment. And the debt is paid in full. Jesus died on the cross, uh, paying for all of our sins. So now we can go before God and say, I've never sinned because Jesus paid for our sins. So sin is not a barrier for mankind. We can all go to heaven uh, because sin is not preventing it, provided that we put our faith in Jesus Christ. Because by putting our faith in Jesus Christ, uh, we receive the gift of salvation. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we get eternal life as a gift from Jesus Christ when we put our faith in him. So what was really required of you is someone asked the question to the Apostle Paul, what must I do to be saved? What do I have to do to be saved? What do I have to do so I can go to heaven? The Apostle Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So this is what's required of you. Believe on Jesus. That means you depend on him. You rely on him. Stop thinking that you can get there some other way because Jesus said, I'm the way. No one comes to the Father but by me. Believe his claim that he's the one and only way to heaven. Jesus says, I'm the truth. If he's the truth, that's what you need to believe. Believe in Jesus. He said, I'm the life. If you want life everlasting, Jesus is the sole source of life. He's the giver of life. Only through Jesus can you get eternal life. So basically, I'm saying reject the way of the world, which is personal merit, working and striving, trying to earn heaven. Reject that and instead depend on Jesus. Trust him. And when that happens, he gives you eternal life as a gift. Now, because it's eternal, that means it, it never ends. You can't lose it. So once we put our faith in Jesus Christ, it is irrevocable. It is irreversible. Uh, that's why I'm happy every day because I'm guaranteed I'm going to heaven. No matter what I do, uh, Jesus says that he, he will never leave me or forsake me. Jesus said, even if I have no faith, he, rem he will remain faithful because he cannot deny himself. He promises us, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He promises us that he will resurrect us to life everlasting if we believe in him. So will you, will you put your faith in Jesus? He is God Almighty who became a man and died for your sins and he was raised from the dead on the third day. Remember, he promised this bodily resurrection as a sign to prove his claims were true. Was he raised from the dead? Scriptures say that he was raised bodily from the dead and he walked among 500 witnesses for 40 days. They talked to him. They, uh, so they saw him. They touched him. They ate with him. And it's that bodily resurrection that is the proof that his promise is true, that he is God and Savior, and that I'm going to go to heaven because I trusted him. Put your faith in him now. I hope you will join me nightly for these live broadcasts, uh, Bible Talk with Brother Luke, 
7 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.